Howdy, everyone, and welcome to another insightful episode of SolarWinds Tech Pod. I'm your host, Sean Sebring, joined by my brilliant co-host, Crystal Taylor. Hello. In this episode, we'll be discussing the realm of possibility. We'll look at trend predictions published by analysts such as Gartner, Forrester, and VMblog. We'll be joined by none other than our very own Sasha Giza, Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager at SolarWinds. Hi, guys. That is a very long title. Uh, it's actually my inofficial title. Uh, these days, I'm called like global tech analyst, uh, evangelist for observability or something crazy. Um, as you probably hear from my voice, I'm from Germany, but don't you worry. I bring good news and we talk about the future. Um, about next year, I think, is our topic, isn't it? Yeah, so today could be 2024 and beyond, as Gartner likes to focus on beyond as well. Uh, but yeah, we'll be looking at trend predictions from a handful of different sources and just kind of discussing our own thoughts on these predictions. Well, let's kick things off with the AI predictions because there are many. Um, even amongst uh, the ones that I pulled, there are several for each um, analyst organization had several around AI, and I think it's a pretty obvious place to start. I mean, even just looking at how much AI has grown this year, uh, generative AI being used more frequently, everyone getting so on board with ChatGPT and all of that stuff, right? I mean, there are complications around that, which I think that is very interesting as well, right? There's not a lot of regulation there yet, and um, there are some predictions that uh, which we'll I'll start with. The first one around regulation is uh, AI trust and risk management um, from Gartner, right? So they're they're saying there's a, a beyond, right? So by 2026, enterprises that apply um, the TRISM controls to AI applications will increase accuracy of their decision making by eliminating 80% of faulty and illegal illegitimate information and all i have to say to that is duh uh ai is only as good as the data is based upon um everyone should know that and if you don't know that please look into it a bit more because it is very important for the data that it's backed by to be trustworthy and legitimate it's really interesting because the like ai is having to be dealt with with base consumers right it's not just tech that is dealing with it. I mean, I've seen stories of them having to come up with um, controls for schools, right? Because kids are using generative AI to write their school papers for them and things like that. And um, so it's being used everywhere. And it is obviously helpful. I mean, Sean, you and I have talked about how sometimes we use them to help us write like an introduction or something boring, right? Where you you have to go make alterations, obviously. It's not perfect the first time around, and it doesn't have any personality for you. But it can help you get started. And I know quite a few people that use it to help them write uh, code, right? Because it's much faster than you having to go through and write. I'd be like, oh, write me a script to do this. And then you just make alterations to it where it's needed. And I find that really interesting, right? That's what we, in my mind, that's what we should be doing is using technology to make our tedious work easier, Um and not not write our papers for us as children, but <laughs> well, I hundred percent agree. And the school thing is actually exactly where I was hoping to go with this because um, I do use it for work, and it's the same argument, but now in the future of you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket, right? And guess what we do, right? So if 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 that mindset was you know twenty years ago, then today being frustrated about the use of AI as cheating is is equally as silly to me almost, because why would we not want to leverage it? I mean, it's not to take away from the fact that assessments can still be done without AI, right? We can have proctored exams and or oral exams, right? Do live testing. There's nothing against that. I think, in fact, the ethical education of utilizing AI would make more sense than trying to um, say that it's potentially damaging education. Because also, just as someone who does use it, um, I use it to help me format, check, spell, check, grammar, you know, all that stuff. It's It's got a wealth of knowledge uh, to help check against that stuff. And so it, it can be insightful. I'll say, here's what I want to say, and I'll structure it as best I can just to see if it comes back with little to no uh, recommendations. But when it does correct, it's just an instant correction for me. And so I think you can learn from it just the same as if a teacher had proofed your paper and gave you notes and feedback on it. I think that quite often people as well as big companies don't even realize 
how much AI they already use because it's in so many tools and solutions that we all use. Hey, um, if I just look at my browser, there's a browser tab by Grammarly, you know, the, the spelling correction thingy. Um, and that is too, too, too small percentage AI driven. Um, Microsoft Office has a new tool. Was it co-pilot, autopilot or something like that? I don't remember. Um, it's using AI. So, so sometimes I guess we don't even realize and, um, that could be potentially scary because one day someone wakes up and like, oh, 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 I was using this machine for all the time. Um, but on the other hand, it's a natural progression. But what you said, you said something interesting there about the ethical use. Um, that, that, that is a topic, uh, a big topic in itself, actually, because before an AI can be used, it needs to be trained, okay? And the process of training an AI is basically like um, how you explain your kid how the world works, right, when it's when it's a small kid. And unfortunately, most AIs are just trained by a very small group of people, of like-minded people. And humanity is diverse. So the the teams who, who create AI should be diverse too. So the AI has a better understanding of how the world works. Um, we are not there yet, um, but uh, I, I, I remotely attended the conference in the UK like a couple of weeks ago um, who are strong supporters of getting more female input in those teams uh, just for more diversity. Yeah, it's definitely a topic we've been seeing a lot over the past year or two, right? Whereas it's become more popular that there is a problem with bias control in AI and, um, you know, it, it's it's like anything else, um, you know, you when you're creating it, you start with a small team or I mean, even if you have a larger team, right, everyone's in the same field. Um, there's a lot of people with like similar interests. So you you lose some of that diversity, even if you think that you're trying to, you still lose it because you don't have the lived experiences that other people have that are different from you. Um, so it's interesting to kind of see where it's going. I think that um, we are, because it is a topic of conversation for humanity as consumers are more using it, that we are going to see some additional controls around that. We're going to see conversations continue around improving because there is no way <laughs> there is no way to continue with with uh, them being completely biased. I mean, as, as I said earlier, it's only as good as the data is backed by. So if the data is biased, then its results are always going to be biased. So it's something to keep in mind um, as people use AI. Um, and like you said, it's used uh, pretty much everywhere now. I mean, our applications use it. Uh, it's, it's, it's all over the place. So you're going to have AI. You can't ignore it. Um, I do want to talk about real quick the the fear that people have, right? AI is going to take my job kind of a thing, right? Um, I think that that's an interesting topic because it happens every time a new technology comes out, right? Like new technology comes out and people are all of a sudden like there's a fear of redundancy. Um, and as we advance, it gets more and more. And I think that um, what's interesting to me, if you look like through history, is this does happen all the time. It's just become a lot more frequent um, because we are advancing at a much a uh, more rapid rate than we used to. And so the the in my opinion, you should always be aware of the fact that you are uh you could be made redundant at any time. So you should always be sharpening your skills or learning something new or being prepared to go take on a new job or role or whatever, right? Like if you, um, a friend of mine used to say, if you are only a DNS admin and, and you are going to be made redundant if you never tried to learn anything out, right? Yeah. It's just don't, don't fear, don't fear the AI, but um, be cautious with it would be what I would say. Well, um, I don't think a DNS admin will ever be redundant because, you know, it's always DNS, right? But mm -hmm. um, uh, any, 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 anyway, um, I had an interesting discussion with um, a guy from Microsoft maybe half a year ago. We met at a random conference. You know, it's my, my, my job to go to conferences. Um, and he told me some interesting stuff. They, um, they had two or three AIs and trained them to create their own language. And this was so successful after a few days they couldn't understand anymore how the AIs communicate. Mm. 
And That's that terrifying. was the point. Yeah, that, that was the point where I shut down this experiment um, because it was absolutely crazy. Um, but he also said that his prediction was like in 20 years, the majority of us in IT will become AI prompters. Could be possible. Interesting. I can totally see that. And and that's kind of where I was talking about with education, being educated on how to leverage it. Because just to go back to chat GPT, because I'm much more familiar with it, I use it um, in my work uh, to, to help me with formatting again and a little bit of content creation from time to time, structuring things. And um, the input, right, the your your question that you ask AI, right, is going to influence what it tells you. So there, there could be two people that go to um, the AI with uh, the same goal in mind, but based off of what they ask it to do and how they ask it to do it, it will definitely give them different results. Um, and I think that there's a skill to leveraging AI. And so, you know, one of the predictions from Forrester says AI will, which they also contradict this later, but uh, AI will shake up the cloud market. I don't necessarily personally agree with that. I think AI is just a tool that all things will be able to leverage, right? It is a it is a cog, right? It is it is a piece of all things um, moving forward from a technology perspective. It it itself isn't a standalone thing that you really you know have to worry about. It's just going to help enhance, improve. Uh, make more efficient and potentially change. The only thing like Crystal was saying is change kind of how we look at things. The jobs will not necessarily disappear, but they will change from what were you doing now? You're going to leverage AI to do it, right? So it, it uh, you know, I think about the self checkout instead of there being tellers to, you know, scan your items for you and ask you for the money, you do it. But now that same person stands there and monitors the situation, right? So their job didn't go away. It just changed a little bit. Instead of, you know, swiping the groceries across the scanner, um, they're, you know, watching for you or now even uh, loading your stuff into bins and wheeling it to your car for you because you did a pickup, right? So things are just changing. They're not going away necessarily. Well, I was in I was in Lithuania two weeks ago for business, and across the road from my hotel was a very small shop, like a convenience store, twenty four seven open, um, AI driven. So you entered the shop, and the first thing you have to do is to swipe your your Mastercard or whatever, and there's like a million cameras on the ceiling. So they they actually follow, and whatever you pick from from the store. And you go to um, to the machine to pay. It's already listed there. It was a fascinating experience. I never moved into such a place. So as I went to paying, it already said at like two bottles of water and a small prosecco. That was totally amazing experience. No humans. Um, I guess there were humans somewhere hiding mm-hmm. and occasionally show up to re- to refill the store. You know, <laughs> but, but this, this was really an interesting experience. But to the point of um, AI will shake up the cloud market. Um, if we replace cloud market and just call it data centers, right? Um, I I do see a little bit more of AI there in regards to converting speech to CLI commands. So the system will be a tool, as you said, John, um, and the tool talks to Cisco and Juniper devices at the same time as if there's no difference, and also obviously to orchestrators. So, so far, we, we would need to create our, our commands, whatever. Uh, the AI could just do this for you. Hey, spin off 20 more machines for customer, blah, blah, blah. Um, I would see that happening. Yeah, you brought up data centers. And I think that, um, you know, sticking with the AI theme that we've got going right now, uh, there was another prediction, uh, the, which I found interesting that it was an alternate prediction from the same analyst uh, agency that... AI will hit a wall due to hardware limitations. And this, I think, could happen, right? We're already starting starting to see limitations because of like GPUs on the market and things like that with crypto and the supply chain problems we've experienced over the past couple of years. And I don't think that that's gone away. It has um, 
lessened, right? Yes. Um, we you can get your PS5 now and things like that, but um, it's certainly lessened over the years. But I think that the the prediction there that it's going to be hard, hitting hardware limitations because they can't get the hardware. I think this is true in a lot of cases in a lot of different areas, right? You can't get um, the silicone you need, for instance, for computer chips sometimes. You know, uh, they had the same problem with getting the chips for uh, vehicles two years ago. They had the same problem with um, it. My my dad works in uh, controls for like uh, like climate controls and things like that for um, air conditioning and that kind of stuff. And they have a hard time sometimes getting their controls because they have computer chips. And it's the same um, kind of problems, right? There is uh, a limit to to what we have available and where we can get it from and how long it takes to get there right so now it's taking even longer to get those things which may put a limiter on how often they can use that right if you don't have the compute power if you don't have the budget to spend on the compute power you may not be using ai as much as perhaps someone at your business wants you to i can see i can see that being a more realistic um prediction there is actually something happening. Um, so most of the the gear is is Nvidia. You know, they they sell some specific chips for for AI. Um, they have a ban on selling those chips to China. Um, you can Google it. Um, but there's no ban uh, selling forty nineties in China. Uh, so so Nvidia forty nineties. So uh, China ordered like hundred thousands of them. And repurpose them into their, I, I don't know, Alibaba or whatever, right? Their their, their data centers. Um, I read about it last week. It's it's quite quite new story. It's interesting. We'll have to ask AI to help us uh, think of an alternative solution to silicon, so we can continue to manufacture these things in mass. Not too similar, but similarly, just talking about. Um, I wouldn't call it a limitation, but a change is the energy efficiency. Uh, we talked about this one pretty briefly uh, uh, when we were preparing for this, and I thought this was incredibly fascinating and could lead to more. But energy efficiency, it's talking about using data centers kind of in a follow the sun model, so to speak, so that where the, and, and Sasha, you can probably expand on this for us. Um, I think you had talked about it a little bit while we were preparing, but um, having the load follow the sun so that it's leveraging solar energy while it's performing its uh, its job that that is um a session i attended a couple of weeks ago and it was really fascinating idea so if you have a very light workload that sits in the cloud and feeds its data into a central location this workload could potentially and automatically um follow the sun just like you explained it so go from data center to data center wherever um, the energy is uh, sourced based on renewable sources. Um, so probably Texas a lot, I guess. There's a lot of sun, right? Um, but there's a night in Texas. So where will it move? Will it move to Europe? Will it move to Australia? I don't know. Um, and if we just talk about the script, a few megabytes or so, uh, the cost of, of transferring or running is neglectable um, compared to... Uh, the energy consumption based on renewable resources. I thought that's a brilliant idea. It's obviously something that won't be able to, um, won't work with any workload. If you have like a big VM somewhere, the cost of moving that thing around wouldn't justify the idea. But in general, it's a good one. And I think the um, the whole situation with being sustainable and energy efficient um, is not limited to AI. I would say that is one of the bigger predictions for next year, which is not solely focused on AI. Uh, something has to happen. And I think data centers are the second um, worst uh, element when it comes to sustainability right behind flying around the world. Yeah. Um, sticking with the kind of green initiatives, I th we had talked about this, I want to say last year, you made a prediction around green initiatives um, and the p green code, I think, is what we talked about last year. But um, Sasha, so, um, you know, you guys can look that up. But uh, I think that it is fascinating that there are pr more predictions around improving our our footprint in tech, right? Like 
company company industry wide, right? There is a there was a prediction that I found really interesting around um, data centers exploring heat reuse, uh, and this um, prediction came out of the fact that there is currently legislation being discussed in Germany. Um, and it was in Germany, um, to uh, require them to reuse heat in their data centers as energy, a certain percentage as uh, like a renewable source of energy in their companies. And I found that really interesting. And the, the prediction was around uh, basically, you know, the rest of Europe and then the rest of the world potentially falling suit if that um, regulation becomes you know, a law becomes a, a required thing. So I found that really interesting. Like, I don't even know how you would go about it. I guess like any other um, geothermal or something like that, uh, things that rely on heat to convert it into energy. Um, but I, why, why wouldn't we try and do that? Um, if, if we, what's, I don't know what the cost behind that is, but one of the, one of the predictions or, or the things that I've been listening to recently was talking about how businesses are not, going to invest that much in um green initiatives if they if it basically if the cost is higher than the result right like if they can be proved that it's going to save them money or something like that or if it's going to save face for them that maybe is potentially enough of an incentive and i think that is a sad but b probably realistic <laughs> um yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I find, it, I find it really interesting to, to explore heat reuse in data centers. I mean, those everyone knows they get they get hot. There's a lot of computers running in one room, and even though we have improved over the last several years, um, have improved cooling systems and all of that for data centers, I think that uh, there's still quite a bit to be done in that area. I don't know how scalable this one is, but um, my best friend works for LCRA, which is, um, what is it? Lower Colorado river, uh, authority, authority. Yeah, there you go. LCRA. Um, and, and, you know, they, they actually have a really, really cool way that they leverage the Colorado river to cool their systems. Um, they actually use it. It, it, it comes from the Colorado river. And so they kind of have their, their data center being cooled by a natural resource. And so, you know, it, it's similar to wind and solar energies, just leveraging an existing source to take care of a job um, without having to burn more energy. Um, I'm sure that at scale, that could be a problem, right? We don't want to, you know, heat the ocean. Uh, not that that would happen, but, you know, you got to be cognizant of what's what's downstream of the heat that we're adding to the Colorado River. Is it going to affect anything negatively? But it's just another kind of cool use case of, hey, let's just let this take care of itself, right? Uh, we run the Colorado River. Uh, let's let's use the Colorado River to cool our systems. Also, I mean, all these these things are baby steps, but every little helps, you know. Yeah. Speaking of baby steps, we talked about this a little bit in our like pre talks, but I do want to bring up the other like major sustainability um, prediction that was in there, which was a, it was in a, it was in Gartner. And their prediction was um, to support long-term ecological balance and human rights. By 2027, 25% of CIOs will have compensation linked to their sustainable tech impact. And I am such as laughing now, um, but I remember when we had this conversation, uh, we were all a bit skeptical. So uh, I don't know where they decided that this was a thing i've never heard of anyone um being compensation plan being tied to it yet so if there's if there's any out there that would be interesting to find out that's where they got this prediction from and it'd be nice if it was <laughs> i love this prediction yes but have no idea who well obviously gartner said it but based off of what data are you creating this prediction Right. What what legislation? Um, why, right. I mean, I love the idea of more accountability like that. I, I think that it would be amazing. Um, but yeah, I would love to see more of why that is a prediction. Um, and maybe we could look into that more. But I, I agree. Skepticism was was, a, a, you know, it was visible <laughs> in Sasha's Sasha's laugh, your smile. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. That's definitely very probably the most interesting one on here. Because where did that come from? I never would have expected to see that in a prediction. It is probably coming from an AI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're trying to influence us with, influence us with um, 
uh, some accountability. That would be great. That would be great. No, I mean, it's, um, look, there's, um, there's different C levels who, who are, uh, more accountable for their actions or things that happen to a company. Um, and yeah, it, 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 I'm totally with you. Uh, accountability should be, should be a bigger thing for C levels, but, but 25% of CIOs will have compensation linked to the sustainable tech impact. Sorry, <laughs> that, 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 that is not going, <laughs> that, that is not going to happen. So here's an interesting one. Um, platform engineering seems to suggest moving back to internal platforms. And this is actually data-driven. You can see this happening. So there is a trend to it. Um, and from Gartner, it is a prediction that it will continue to suggest moving back to internal platforms. What do you guys think? Well, I found this interesting because they have like the flip side. <laughs> They have the flip side prediction as well, where use of cloud platforms were increased. So we're increasing cloud, but we're also going to increase uh, our moves back to internal platforms. I think this is realistic, though. There's a um, VM blog had similar prediction there as well, right, where they're starting to shift back to you, uh, back to you, um, data centers for some things. Right. And I think that this is an interesting uh, response for me, it's similar to the reaction we had to like the pandemic, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, we all had to make a choice of how we were going to support everyone at home, and uh, we put in plans and we we made quick decisions. Of, this is how we're going to support it, and then after people started going back to work or things like that, they had to revise all of that stuff, right? You make these quick decisions of like, oh, this is the hot thing. This is the thing we need to be doing. Some uh, executive has, has made a mandate that says we must be X percent in the cloud or whatever, and you have to follow through on that. Well, then you can start to see diminishing returns on some things, right? It doesn't make sense for everything to be in the cloud necessarily, right? Like you, there are, there are, it's a it's a tool just like any other. It's a place to to host things, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right tool for the job every time. So I think that we have come as an industry to the realization that it doesn't solve all problems, and sometimes it costs us more. And that I think is where this shift is coming from, right? It's it costs us more, or is not as accessible as we want it to be, or we don't have as much control over it as we want to have. And I think that that's where these predictions are sort of coming from: is that um, developers, especially when they're developing like smaller applications, they want to be able to um, touch all the pieces of their of their code and everything, especially during the like initial development process. They need better access to it. You know, you eventually you transition into like a higher scale thing as you're as you're developing it. But in the beginning, especially, it makes sense maybe to have that all more local where you can have better access, easier access. You don't have to worry about as much controls or the cost of transferring data to and from the cloud and things like that, right? Um, so I think that this prediction makes sense uh, in a lot of ways, right? We're, we're coming to the realization that it's not the answer to every problem. I think like most things that trend, which cloud was trending and... And for good reason too, right? It can be a good solution, and and, and so it, it trended not just because of its capability, but because of what it said about you as an organization, right? It was the more modern look, the more modern feel, the more mature, more capable. So there was a lot associated with moving to the cloud, right? From the stigma perspective, um, and so now that the stigma is kind of a little over, people are actually taking a more realistic look at things and saying is this better for us right now that it's not just a trend, then we should be going there. Everyone else is doing it right. They're having a more realistic look at, is this the right move for us as an organization too? And I think the second thing is like you mentioned, Crystal, this was probably the first thing to me, but the second thing is cost, right? Um, I am a video streaming subscriber to many platforms now um, and they all continue to go up. So at some point you realize that uh, you know the subscription model is is starting to do a lot more than you realized to your bank account. And the same thing could be true from a cloud perspective, right? You just have to weigh what makes the most sense. I um, mean, this could be kind of uh, a move that'll be a stick it to them from a subscription perspective that, hey, if you want cloud and, and SaaS to continue to be the, the number one choice, it has to be affordable too. 
I I was actually talking to um, a, a very big company on a conference uh, who are in exactly that situation. They got um, I, I tried to uh, leave all the names out of it. So they they got a huge bill from their cloud provider month by month by month by month by month, and they they bit the bullet. Okay, but at some point they were like, it's just not feasible anymore. So they checked what old infrastructure they still had on site, which was basically collecting dust, um, but was still okay. And they bought like five, six more servers, modern servers, uh, to give it a little bit more nice touch and um, put um, their development system on back on prem. Now, they got a huge bill for the software which they are using. Uh, I give it a name. This is OpenShift. Okay, so it's not exactly something um, that's that's really cheap, uh, but it was a calculation for them, and um, they have this with a with a maintenance contract for an X amount of years, and it is significantly cheaper um, than running this in the cloud. But Sean, as you mentioned. Um, some workloads like like a mail server or a collaboration platform, they are perfect in the cloud. You know, there's there's no need to to keep those things on prem, particularly in the times where we live, where people work from all over the world and just even from a cafe or whatever, right? Um it's just much more simple to to keep such things in the cloud. Yeah, I like the idea, Sean, you were talking about subscription services earlier, and I like the idea that we're coming back around to the realization that maybe basic cable pricing wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and it's a convenience thing too. So even as like now that Netflix streaming or Hulu, right, we've gotten so used to having what we want on demand right there, uh, whereas, you know, the the cable approach was, is it on TV right now? Right. You know, thinking back to the channels uh, that you would flip through. So it, it's just, you know, again, it's a cost benefit analysis. And and I think that people are taking it a little more um, seriously now because it's not just the trending thing of this is where we're headed, the cloud. Right. It, it It's not that it's going away. It's just that people are looking at it, I think, more realistically now. Yeah. Um, you know, switching gears a little bit, uh, we, you know, we talked about supermarkets earlier, which is why it's driving me to this next um, prediction that I saw, which was that we're going to have see more machine customers, which I found really, really interesting as a concept, which were, you know, for like online shops and things like that, e-shops, you have uh, essentially a bot that can behave like a real customer. It can go, it's not just uh, ROM or, uh, you know, real user monitoring or, um, you know, a bot that has is prescribed to do a set thing, but they use AI to like generate a, a personality. So you don't know what it's going to buy. You don't know what it's going to do. Um, and I found that really fascinating. I think that would be really interesting, especially for, I mean, I worked retail for, for many years. I think that it is a really fascinating concept to try and improve your stores by getting data from, I mean, it, effectively it's, it's a script or whatever that's running and and if then if this and then that and if not then this other thing so like i think it's really interesting that you can walk through the whole steps even better than synthetic user monitoring or real user monitoring it's not kind of the next evolution of synthetic user monitoring i think is is what this machine customer sort of resembled to me is that, you know, right now we have the ability to do send synthetic monitoring where you can pretend to be a user, but you tell it what steps to take. You tell it um, to go download a file or go put thing in a cart and whatever, but you can't complete the transaction, right? Like you can't go all, all the way through the entire process. There are limitations to that. And of course it is prescribed. So, you know, at a certain point you, you may run into things like caching and things like that that are happening. So you're getting an artificially um, lowered sense of how long the process would take for a new user, for instance, right? Because um, if you're not if you're not turning off that caching and things like that, there's all those limitations to those things, uh, which are which are great and useful. But I think this is like the next level of it. So I find it really uh, really intriguing to see where that's going to go. I'm con I'm curious. I don't quite get the use case for this here. Is it is it while developing, let's say, a website or an application to uh, so that they get feedback from a bunch of fake customers? To, okay, QA. It's testing. 
it's it's testing and the ai is probably uh, creative can do unpredictable stuff uh, like humans would do um but obviously cheaper than humans uh, but now i'm just wondering what the ai is doing with those 20 boxes of toilet paper that arrive <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure they have a little develop a customer ID that they can then remove all that stuff from uh, from orders or things like that. There's got to be some uh, back end management that's going to be required for these things. But use case scenarios, I think it's really quality assurance, right? Like you're not only able to test how long it takes them to get things in their cart and get through the transactional process and whatever, you're, you're able to see, you know, you know what, depending on how the AI is built, like maybe it's looking at um, trends and things like that so that you can see what people are buying more of based on what this AI bot is doing. You can like these, I, I can see lots of use cases, but I always said myself for a well, while, quite a while, like I said, so I can, I can kind of understand how this would be really useful to us, uh, you know, an electronic storefront, especially, to, to go through the process of if it's um, collecting data from elsewhere or from, you know, maybe it's fronted with collected data. These are the things that people have bought the most in, in this time period in the last whatever. And so it goes through the process. I don't really know, um, but I find the whole um, idea of it very interesting. I think it could be useful um, in the end. I have actually, this that triggered something for me um, where it's similar uh, I think exists already for, okay, I'm a gamer. Um, and in fact, I think all three of us are, um, we're all three gamers, but I play a mobile game on my phone and it's a five V five for the most part. Right. And oftentimes I'm like, I swear this guy is a bot. I'm like, I swear <laughs> the first time playing with is a bot. And so I talk some trash and then guess what? The bot talked trash back and I'm still not convinced that he's not a bot <laughs> just because he did that. And I'm like, and there's a reason that they would want to put bots in there because they want to inflate it so that matchmaking doesn't take so long. You can always play. And if they don't have enough players, they'd need these machine customers, kind of like the prediction, but they'd be players instead. And so like, I believe AI is not just playing the character, but also communicating with the team based off of how they've seen the other players communicating, which means they're really good at trash talk too. See, that just makes me think like, what's the next level of that? This makes me go into the malicious side of things. Like uh, they, they're going to start using, and maybe they already do, I don't know, but they're going to start using bots to catfish people and uh, you know, all these other things. Like there's, there's obviously there's two sides to every coin. There's the benefit that we can see, but we should never forget about the other side of this where people can use these things for ill. Isn't there when you when you're a chess player, they have this ELO rating, I think. Have you ever heard of this? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And and I mean if you if you use machines um to push your ratings, um <laughs> I could see that as a consequence, right? So going back to cloud, um another prediction from VM blog is cloud infrastructure security probably not just security in my opinion, but here it says security will shift left away from monitoring to more proactive. Um, I feel like that is and has been happening. So I'm wondering if they just mean more of it um, now that AI is becoming more capable. Um, you know, I feel like uh, monitoring is, is not a thing of the past, but if we can tell our tools exactly what we're looking for, you know, it, and then ask the tool to do exactly what I'm going to be doing, right? It's very scripted for the person who's reacting to the monitoring. Uh, so this totally makes sense to me. And, you know, it's already been happening. And I agree, it will continue in 2024 and continue to grow and get bigger and bigger. Now, Sean, I'm a very experienced monitoring professional. And I don't like you saying that monitoring might be a thing of the past. Um, I think that it is... <laughs> Your job is only changing, Crystal, not going away. No, of course not. That's that's why we call it observability these days. Yeah, but it's evolving. It's evolving. I don't think that it is ever going to be a thing that isn't used, right? But the fact of the matter is that we do have to get to a more proactive state. And I think you're right. That is already starting to happen. We've definitely, we've definitely seen it. But like... I think the, the idea behind the prediction is that it's going to become more common, right? That um, observability and other proactive forms of monitoring, whatever they happen to be, um, and proactive resolutions, which I think is the 
key here. It's talking it's talking proactive in the monitoring and everything like that. But I think resolutions is where the key to all of this is, right? If you can get the knowledge ahead of time to prevent, to take preventative action. So you like it, you know, like forecasting. We we've been doing that for years. That's like very mild um uh, understanding there of like we can forecast in six months you're going to run out of space based on the usage that you've had over the past six months or whatever um those things right you can then predict and say oh, okay well to be proactive in the two months before i'm just going to add more storage or i'm going to offload uh x amount of data somewhere else or whatever right you can make these decisions uh ahead of time which prevents downtime and i think the i've talked about this before on TechPod where the we have reached a real level of impatience as a global society where we're not willing to wait for things like at all. <laughs> um, so or like page load times can't be, I mean, if it's taken more than five seconds, people are leaving. Like, you know, you have like, these are, these are real problems that um, businesses are facing that they have to deal with. And the proactivity, which is becoming more and more common, is helping them to get ahead of those problems before they become a problem, right? Like you, if your um, e-commerce site goes down for five minutes, maybe that costs you $600,000 or whatever. Like, you know, it, it's, it's tied to real dollars. So that means that they're spending more attention and more time into investing on the front end so that those things don't happen. I have an interesting example of the proactivity from a security standpoint and a, and a much more practical application. Um, also just quick note, talking about, um, us demanding consumers moving from the U S I now live in Ireland, moving to Cork. Uh, Amazon's just not the same. <laughs> uh, I can't do my same day deliveries. Right. Um, and so I've, I've, I've reset my expectations uh, when it comes to my demanding consumerism. Um, but anyway, um, another thing about the travel and uh, hats off. I was, I'm a, I had been a Google Fi um, customer and when I went to France uh, last spring and when I moved here to Ireland, again, proactively, my phone just said, hey, I noticed you're here. Don't worry. We've got you covered based on your plan. Um, and kind of similarly, again, is banks, right? Since you can install your mobile banking, it actually knows where you are and it will uh, see that you're next to an ATM. It can say you're in a different country. Do you need uh, you know, assistance from a security perspective? Um, so those are really proactive ways rather than, whoops, I got locked out of my card because I traveled and forgot to update something. And then I swiped in a different country and you know now it's fraud. And so they locked it. So they're adding it to all sorts of different things. Again, it's already happening. It's just continuing to trend um, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy with it. Um, I'm also one of the people who doesn't really care if Google gives me ads because I'm like, you know what? I actually did want that. <laughs> you know, you're listening to my whole house and conversations. All of a sudden stuff's showing up. I'm like, yeah, but actually I was talking about that. I was interested. So thank you for sending me an article. Don't get that. me started, Sean. It's a different conversation. Conversation for <laughs> another day. The, the Amazon thing, actually, there's a different reason, um, and that is the Brexit. So previously, Amazon stuff came from the UK. Um, now it usually doesn't because you have to pay extra, so it's being shipped from the continent. Well, Sasha, that's um, why I use the German uh, Amazon store more than the UK one being here in Ireland. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. cheaper. Even even the shipping costs the time, are more expensive. Too. But, yeah. um, but you know what? what I... Uh, probably will see, and this is the last time I'm talking AI for today, I promise, um, it will remarkably change the way we access and process data. Um, so there's no more going to a DBA and, hey, can you, can you run that query for me and put it in a nice chart? Or we use, we use super clunky tools like, like, we use Tableau here, right? It's a nightmare. <laughs> At least for me, it is a nightmare. Um, wouldn't it be totally awesome if we could go just like, hey, Siri, how much toilet paper did we sell in Texas in the last quarter and get those results instantly? Um, I, I could see that happening more and more. I okay, love that idea. Is. Yeah, my, 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 my Siri is just <laughs> replying. What, I don't know what she told me. <laughs> She, she's trying to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. There's your AI for you. Um, 
No, I love that. I love the accessibility to that kind of data, which is, again, why I've been such a fan of the availability of ChatGPT. Um, it's just like having a handy assistant that can answer a bunch of little questions for me, and I don't have to you know, put a note for myself, hey, remember to go research this, and then I forget because I didn't actually make the note. I can just do it on demand and get some answers and, and feedback live right there. It's It's super cool, super handy. Well, I'll switch gears again because the last the last one that I want to cover of the predictions that I found really interesting is, of course, around um, learning, um, which if anyone has ever heard me talk about anything before, I do like to talk about keeping your skills up. I mentioned it earlier. Um, this one is uh, that we'll see an increase in the use of intelligent technology for skill augmentation and accelerated time to competency. And I found that super interesting. Interesting. So the prediction is like the time to competency thing is for like um, onboarding new employees, right? So using um, intelligent te technology instead of using an individual person and walking them through and holding their hand for six weeks or whatever to use our technology to increase the time to them actually being able to return results on whatever they're job responsibilities are. Um, and I do think that there is a good place for technology in learning and skilling up. I mean, there are so many opportunities now that we didn't have even 10 years ago to learn stuff, right? I don't feel the need to go and get a master's degree in a regular institution and go to classes and all of those things. And you know, no shade to anyone who does that. I think that there are different paths for everyone, but there is so much available online and through classes and through the use of AI that you can learn things. And, uh, you know, as, as I say that I said earlier, be cautious because it's only as good as the data that backs it. The same thing is true of any learning classes that you take or any online free classes. There's a lot of materials out there. There's a lot of um, really great things available. So many people are writing blogs and all of those things, right. To help you learn new things because we all learn different ways. Um, but you know, Make sure your source is trustworthy, obviously. Um, there's still not great things out there, too, um, just like there always were. I mean, I can definitely remember learning things in school from school textbooks that uh, are not right. So um, you learn later that those things are not the whole story or they're not telling you everything you need to learn, right? So there's definitely an element of that behind it. But I, I like the idea of using intelligent technology whether that be in the form of AI or whether that be in the form of a machine customer, right? Like maybe that machine customer, you have to be on the other end and you watch how it goes through the process. And that's part of your learning experience or, um, you know, anything, whatever, whatever that happens to be. I think that there's room for it. And uh, in my experience, a lot of times companies do not uh budget time appropriately for onboarding new employees in the sense that the person that they use for the onboarding that already works there has to do their full-time job on top of also onboarding the new employee. Um, and they don't give them additional time for that. They don't offload their workload for that time period or anything like that. And that's not true for everyone, but it is, uh, it is often the case where you're just expected to do your regular job. And also let me teach you, even back when I was a server, right? You're a server, you, you go to a restaurant, and you, you have a trainee server that's going to be there. They're just walking around with the regular, the, the full-time server doing everything that they're doing, following them around like a little puppy, right? They go everywhere they go. They are teaching them the whole time that they're actually doing their job. So, um, it, and it's so, you know, it's all walks of life. It's not just technology that does this, but um, I find it really intriguing. Like maybe that'll help offset some of that workload of training a new employee um, to do your job or the junior level of your job or whatever. Um, if you can have a little bit more um, assistance from technology to help them on board. I'm stumbling about accelerated time to competency. That sounds amazing to me. But time to competency should be measurable then, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm, when I'm not traveling, I try to learn Kubernetes, which is a nightmare. Um, it, it, it's taken weeks already, right? It will probably take months before I completely understand it. Um, yeah, if a machine could help me with that, I would totally buy into it. I would love it, yeah. Well, and I know part of that is, you know, people learn in different ways and they typically have a, like one way of learning a thing, especially if you're onboarding a new employee. This is the, the set way we have of training a new employee. We're not going to do anything differently. So the time to competency, I think, is different for every person. But if you can reduce it 
in any way, I think those should always be considered. I think we, we, we have a good example for ourselves. Look, I'm with SolarWinds for almost 10 years. And when I started, um, I've been told, here's the demo website, there's the documentation, good luck. That's it, right? Um, and nowadays, when someone starts, we have all these learning portals, we created our own, we actually have a department for that. Um, so it's it's manual labor, all right? But uh, I could see very well that in the future, when such solutions exist and are affordable, um, there will be there will be it will be hot stuff. Everyone is going to use it. I just was going to ask Sasha if he has any predictions of his own for next year. My prediction for myself is um, I will go to Bali for business and will will. I, I actually do, and I will attach a full week for pleasure, um, <laughs> just to enjoy the sun. That that is that is the biggest thing I plan so far for next year. That's amazing. But do you have any tech predictions? I know in the, in the past we have, um, you know, when we were head geeks, we had come up with tech predictions. Do you have any tech predictions that we didn't cover this uh, in this episode so far of your own? Um, well, the, we, we talked about the green thing, um, which has to happen. I don't want people glue themselves in front of data centers instead of the roads. I don't know if they do this in the U.S. They do this here frequently. Maybe we can find proper technology helps us to help us fighting climate change. Um, that 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 is definitely something interesting. Um, what else will we see? Um, we will see an oversaturation in the market for AI frameworks, I guess, because everyone comes around with the next best thing. And keep in mind, when a company is evaluating like a normal piece of software, like, like one of our tools, maybe, um, the evaluation process can very well take a couple of months. Okay. Now imagine that with, um, an AI, AI system that will take ages. And actually, there's one more thing. So when 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 a software vendor creates software that has AI built in, there's two ways where it's coming from. One is A, the framework. So I buy a framework and just adjust it, or I create my own. Now, remember what happened two years ago with um, Log4j with a small piece of open soft, uh, open source software, which everyone used. Um, suddenly, there was like a zero day in that piece of software, and everyone had to change their tools. Now imagine that happens with one of the AI frameworks. Oh, boy, the consequences could be really disastrous if you consider um, how powerful these things are and how very well connected they are. At some point, we will see AIs fighting AIs. <laughs> Isn't that almost a Terminator scenario? Uh, almost. That, that, that was machines against humans, but we we would see AIs fighting AIs, and we just okay. sit there and eat popcorn and see see what's 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 the outcome. I'm sure that will have no repercussions on humanity. <laughs> we'll just have to fight Skynet with some solar winds. Yeah. What a fun way to end today's topic on trend predictions. Thank you for that, Sasha. And thank you, Crystal. Let's roll into our rapid fire questions round now. And since we've had Sasha as a guest before, we're going to try and throw some different stuff his way. Sasha, what is your favorite video game of all time? All the time. Well, we are not recording um, this as a video. Oh, I, my tattoo is on the back. We wouldn't see it anyway. Um, I have the tattoo of Quake in my back. You know, the very old game from the 90s with um, that that round thingy and the nail through it um because it was the first time i saw uh one of those what was the name those 3d cards v voodoo i think was the name um first time i saw actual 3d and i will never forget this moment in my life um obviously this is like 30 years ago i don't play it anymore actually it, it there was like a re-release you can get it for five dollar or something um but it's 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 showing its age but the impact it had on my life was pretty amazing. Um, these days, I'm still amazed by Cyberpunk, the um, the add-on. Pretty great. Uh, one of the best games these days. Um, 
and I'm still playing it once a year or so in a different in a different way. So you can play it in different ways, right? That's awesome. And also, Sasha, perfect description of the Quake logo. Um, I hope you all were able to visualize that the way I was. That I don't know. I'm actually kind of curious now, since we're all gamers, Crystal, can you share yours? I know it's not really rapid fire at this point, but go ahead. My favorite video game of all time is Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which is the most basic answer, but it is true. I have played that game, I want to say, upwards of 15 times, and it doesn't change like Cyberpunk does. <laughs> it is the same story, and uh, nothing about it is different, and yet I have played it many times over. I love that game. I will say, when the New York games came out, Breath of the Wild and now Tears of the Kingdom, that those are very really close like second place for for me but because of nostalgia ocarina of time is going to be my favorite forever you know that that was my answer too um and there's no shame in it then just the the orchestration the music in those is so good uh, so good in fact uh, they came out with them available for nintendo switch online and i played through them with my daughter and that was great memories for us um, she's, of course, also now into Breath of the Wild, and we've done some Tears of the Kingdom, not as much as I'd like, uh, but moving was was a lot for us. But yes, agreed, fantastic video game. Love it, and it's not a basic answer. There's a reason it's a lot of people's favorites. My current favorite, though, like that I'm playing right now, is Baldur's Gate 3, <laughs> which is also probably not surprising. I have yet to pick that up. I really want to. I, I, I played it, um, but I didn't finish it. I don't know. Um, it didn't really hit me didn't work for me I'll, I'll tell you it my best experience has been playing with other people so like it is it's good by itself but it is great with other people i don't like people <laughs> <laughs> sasha what talent would you most like to have if you could just snap your fingers and give yourself a talent what would it be um, I have a keyboard in front of me. I would love to actually be able to play it, like like piano. Um, all I can do is like bum bum, very simple stuff. I would love to be able to play the piano. We get musical answers a lot for that, and I agree. It's it's something that you can admire, but you can't just pick up <laughs> the way you'd like to, right? It takes uh, a special part of the brain and years of mastery for most. So, and and. It takes musical theory, which is like, yawn. <laughs> so Sean asked me this question before I was a host and I was just guessing, but I like this question. So if you could go live on, if you could be one of the first people to go live on Mars, would you? Um, in theory, yes, but I'm not sure how Amazon is going to deliver. Um, but, 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 but yes, why not? Why not? Interesting experience. Um, well, you have to wear those weird suits when you go from home A to home B. That's maybe not so great. Um, but uh, I would totally do it. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it can't be that much different than living in Ireland, right? It's raining outside. You got to put on a big suit, walk to your neighbor's house. So you've, you've already practiced that. So you 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 haven't been uh, to Ireland long. That's the saying. Um, it never rains in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, this this is good insight about you, Sasha. What would you consider as your greatest achievement? My greatest achievement. Um, seeing how how proud and happy my mother was when I was on the title of a magazine for the first time of a print mag. Um, that happened twice to me. I sent uh, copies, both of them, to my mother, and she was absolutely happy. And that that was an amazing moment, actually. That's so wholesome. That is so. That's a beautiful moment to to even just picture. Awesome. Uh, if you could choose what to come back as, what would it be? If you were to reincarnate, um, that's a fun one. Like come back as like an animal. <laughs> what? What? Is yeah, that? you could be an animal, a rock, a tree. Um, yeah. What would you come back as? I would like to be my cat. <laughs> Your cat. My my cat is allowed to do everything. Is totally spoiled. Okay. Let's let's take this further. Are you still the owner of yourself? Like, would you be the cat of Sasha, and Sasha is still there? That sounds confusing. 
<laughs> if I could swap with my cat instantly, um, I probably would. <laughs> freaky, freaky Friday style. <laughs> I, I would, I would, I would. I mean, I, I don't, I don't see him right now. Oh, um, this is wonderful. I'm imagining a cat Sasha that is on a call just meowing, you know, and it's like, what's what's wrong with Sasha today? <laughs> would it would it meow with a German accent though? No, it is actually a Turkish cat. Um, ah, we, okay. we got him from a Turkish family, and his name is Chicken, which means dirty dude, <laughs> for, for, for whatever reason. Super fun. Awesome answers, Sasha. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thank you, listeners, for joining us on another episode of SolarWinds Tech Pod. I'm your host, Sean Sebring, joined by fellow host, Crystal Taylor. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe and follow for more Tech Pod content. Thanks for tuning in. Auf Wiederhören.